continuation with what we were discussing, the important question remains, what does change mean in the context of organizations? There are three options. One is to increase the driving forces. The second is to decrease the restraining forces. And the third, an obvious derivation, combination of the two approaches. I'm going to spend some time looking at what could be the driving forces, what could be the decreasing or uh, by what could be the restraining forces and how would you uh, combine the two. Now, a simple diagram which helps you to understand the relationship between restraining forces and driving forces with reference to the desired state and what is status quo. Status quo would be a balance between the restraining forces and the driving forces which create a stability which is corrosive. Nothing moves. Everything has been brought to a halt because the forces of change are equivalent to the forces of resistance. Broadly speaking, how can change be classified? What could we say is the nature of change? Now, the nature of change can be mental, vital, physical. Let us understand each of these words. Mental change is change, it happens according to some design. Vital, it is probabilistic system. Sometimes this happens, sometimes that. There is no predictab predictive validity. Physical, all is fixed, change is at the best incremental. Now, this is best understood in terms of types of change which would be ordered change, random change, limited change. Put together in a matrix format, this ex helps you to exp explain degrees of freedom which is the lowest in physical change, mixed in vital change and highest in mental change. Put it simply, when you are looking for material change, your choices are very limited when you are look, looking for change in frameworks of reference, there is a huge possibility of change. Physical or vital or mental study events in isolation, change seems random, study events syst systemically, possibly some sense of order emerges. Is the business world, if the in the business world, is change physical, vital, or mental. What are the factors influencing change? External factors are economic and market changes, which is why it is my belief that every organization, if the size permits and if the resources permit, must have an environment scanning cell. You must know what is happening, which is where I look at R and D as an enabling function. The other external change is technological innovation. Technology has changed. This is what crippled the steel industry in this country. When the steel industry was launched in the early 50s, India was the world leader. Over a period of time, we lost pace to far eastern countries, essentially because we did not keep pace with the understanding of a very simple process in steel smelting, which was the process of oxidation. You pass oxygen over the blast furnace, the process is expedited. Such a simple technological change alters the pace of your steel production and give yourself two decades, we became not only followers, but we became obsolete. Therefore, if you do not respond to external forces, the belief that you need not change because you do not want to change is no longer valid because even if you do not change, the external world has changed. Then there are internal factors of change, organization structure changes. Just as people will relay, re, relay 
the furnitures of a room. The same room occupied by two different incumbents for two different periods of time will have a change in layout. Somebody will keep his table east facing, somebody will keep his table north facing. And the moment he makes his table north facing, the rest of the room layout has to change. Changing employee demographics. There are any number of cases in, a, in Indian industrial scene where you banned recruitment for 10 years, then one particular year you lost 30 percent of your people. Now, it is very, very easy to be fashionable and say no more recruitment and especially if you come from the bureaucracy, you tend to open your shoulders wide because you know you are the, you are from the controlling system and you say any change you want but no recruitment and you feel very grand about it. Sitting on a board, I have to tell this functionary, you have just nailed the organization 10 years from now. And if you think he was convinced and if you think he changed his position, wrong number. All he did was flare up and say, you are known to have such views. I said, well then I am paid to be here to share my views. One danger of power is you confuse your power for omniscience. You know it all. And if you make extreme statement, you sound particularly grand to yourself. Any change all of you want, but no more recruitment. Wow, what a grand statement of cost cutting. My own feeling is every literate person every professional needs to have some understanding of organization management because no matter how he plays it and whether he is a scientist or a navy man or a trader, he still needs to cope with an environment. Therefore, there are two types of factors, structural factors and changing employee demographics. Lasting and meaningful organizational change ultimately comes from individuals who are building blocks of an organization. A fairly simple statement to understand, nothing much to explain there. People need to understand why the change is necessary. Organizations must effectively communicate the need for a change to all their members before attempting any kind of change. Of course, it is a fond nation, notion that if you explain to some explain something to some people they will understand doesn't always work out people may choose not to understand or understanding is too complicated vision represents the force that guides the organization and provides a sense of purpose and direction Vision comprises of four parts, organization's core values and beliefs, enduring purpose of the organization, a highly compelling and mission or purpose, a vivid description of the mission. Therefore, a link between change and organizational vision is important because no matter how well the organization has grown, any organizational reality will be an approximation of the organizational vision. If an organization has truly realized its vision, then it is ready to wither away because it is no longer needed. The goal has been reached and once the goal has been reached, you need to reset the goals. What do you work towards? Any time an organization attempts to change individual and groups within the organization are likely to resist the change process. This is a very important principle to understand. Any prevailing situation will have its vested interest. Any prevailing situation 
will have its stakeholders. Therefore, any change will ask for a reallocation of the turf. And nobody who loses his turf wants to lose it. Although people may be dissatisfied with the way the organization currently functions, change always worries the risk of making the situation worse. Which is why everyone talks of change, but everyone wants the other person to change, not oneself. Oh, change is great. Why don't you change? You talk of training, everyone says training is great. Why don't you train my boss? Or better still, training is great, train my subordinate. So I turn around and say, honey, how about training you? Oh, sir, I am perfect. You, you, you know me. <laughs> to, to which, of course, I become very unpopular and I say, I don't even know my own child. How could I know you? What did you mean? I said, I meant exactly what you understood. He said, but you have known me all these years. I said, yes, but knowing you is one thing. Knowing you is another. Sir, now you are confusing me. To which my answer is, you are always confused. When you don't want to understand something, you become confused. How come people who do not know how to apply online are so good at applying for the American visa or the British visa online? But if you ask them to look at a website, Sir, I don't know computers. Now, you don't know computers, but how did you apply for your American visa online? Because you want to apply for that visa online. You see the problem? Intention is the core. Once the intention is there, you begin to understand. And if you feel threatened, your capability also shrinks. Now, there is no recipe to given someone, giving someone intention and that is a real problem of change. How do you get people to change? In situations where change is perceived as more threatening than beneficial, organizational members will be unwilling to accept change. What are the bar barriers to change therefore? Failure to recognize the need for change. It is working fine. There is a society I am dealing with currently, which has a constitution which is more than 22 years old. For two years, they are debating the need for a change in the organization. And there is this venerable gentleman now in his 70s. Whenever the constitutional amendment comes up, he starts yelling, shrieking, ranting, raving, you name it, it is all there. And he has only one theme. Where is the need for change? It is working very well. Now, he tends to believe that world has not changed in 20 years. And he makes so much noise, the other people concerned find it so much more convenient to say, okay, we will consider it another day. And he is very happy with it. Now, this, uh, this I do not think is a, life, is a life story of only one organization. Your ability to rant and rave and impart to your position a nuisance value is a great force in resisting change. People who espouse change will also begin saying, yeah, I know things are not working as well they should, but they are working. Now, who will go through all this process? Let it continue. Inertia is a very consoling factor and I do not wish to elaborate upon it. Misunderstanding the purpose, process and outcomes of change. You do not know how much you need change. A lot of relationships of parent child are rooted in this. Inability of the child to understand that there are limits to parental change and the inability of the parents to understand that the child itself does not understand the consequences of change. Therefore, how do you work out a rhythm? By establishing dialogues. And my own feeling is that if you want to work out organization change, you must work on dialogues. 
people must start talking to each other and each organization needs multiple dialogues. The finance man needs to talk to the marketing man. The human resources man needs to talk to the manufacturing man. They don't explain each other to the other person because each one is convinced if I am not there the organization will close. If any part is not there, the organization will close. It is like a bodily system. The body would collapse if the brain was not there, if the lungs was not there, if the heart was not there, if the kidney was not there, if the pancreas was not there. There is only one part of the body which you can undergo a surgery with without damaging its functioning and it is quite literally called the appendix. Every other part of the body, if you were to lop it off, would cause serious malfunctioning of the body. So, what is the, what is the part of saying, you know, heart is the most important organ? Isn't lungs the most important organ? No, 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 no. You see, you, 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 can, you can function with one lung. Then, you know, hair splitting starts. Or you, you function with one lung. Great. So, you function with a pacemaker. Is not kidney important? No, kidney also is too, you know, no. Why, why am I putting it that way? People start discovering arguments for what they want to believe. And this unique ability of the homo sapien to find arguments for what they want to present may be the undoing of the race itself. Because the objective reality does not get conditioned by what you would want it to be. Let me repeat that. It is an important takeaway. The objective reality does not get changed by the fact that you would want it to be something else. The fear of the unknown is a great barrier to change. Threats to existing social relationships is a great barrier to change. Reluctance to give up old work routines and habits is a great barrier to change. Organizational barriers to change have other elements, a reward system that reinforces old ways of doing things. If you have a reward system which reinforces old ways of doing things, you will never have change. Threats to existing balance of power, intergroup conflicts that inhibit cooperation, incompatibility of change processes and organizational culture, heavy investment in previous decisions and course of action. Unless you understand the barriers of change, you will not be able to manage change. And unless you are able to manage change, you cannot even develop the function, let alone the organization. So, what is the discussion point? Depending upon the nature of the resistance and the need for organization, several strategies are available for dealing with resistance to change. If you have a problem, you have a solution. It is simple. But please remember, as potentially good candidates for being specialists in organization development, each solution creates its own problem. It is a dialectical process. So, ultimately you have to decide what is it that you are willing to settle down for. What then are the methods for dealing with resistance to change? Let us look at the solutions. So, I am going to show to you several slides under four columns. The first one will be for approach, the second will be commonly used when and the sentence is completed below the third of advantages and fourth of disadvantages. For example, one approach for overcoming resistance to change is education and communication. It is commonly used when there is a lack of information or accurate information and analysis. What is the advantage? Once persuaded, people will often help implement the change. What is the disadvantage? Can be very time consuming if many people are involved. So, remember the four column heads, approach commonly used, advantages, disadvantages, which this will carry on to other sides. So, let us go to the next slide. Approach 
commonly used advantages disadvantages i hope that's clear and it will continue in the next slide approach commonly used when advantages disadvantages approach participation and involvement commonly used when initiators not enough not enough information others resist considerably advantage people participating help in implementing disadvantage can be time consuming and in, and an inappropriate change designed next facilitation and support when people resist because of adjustment problems advantage no approach works as well as with adjustment problems disadvantage can be time consuming costly and can still fail negotiation settlement groups with power lose in the change sometimes an easy way expensive if it alerts others to negotiate when you negotiate then others may see the disadvantages and then may then may then, then they may start negotiating manipulation cooperation other tactics do, don't work or are too costly then you use manipulation co cooperation or cooperation can be inexpensive and quick can lead to future problems if people feel manipulated explicit and implicit coercion speed is essential and initiators have powers speedy and overcome any resistance can be risky if it leaves people angry with initiators understanding an organization's culture is a critical first step in gauging the level of resistance a change effort is likely to encounter again you go back to the cultural paradigms all successful change efforts have some impact on organizational culture however since organizational culture develops slowly efforts to change it will generate varying degrees of resistance this is the operational sentence since organizational culture develops slowly efforts to change it will generate varying degrees of resistance therefore resistance would be much easier to handle if it was a common resistance people may have different reasons for resistance people may have different intensity of resistance and what's the worst people may get into a resistance mode at different points of time but you were agreeing with me till yesterday what happened sir i have thought over it now i don't want to do it have a heart sir it doesn't matter sir i don't think i can do it and of course very endemic in cultures were saying one thing doing another is a virtue how do you do? Ah, what why should i keep on doing what i have said no 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 wait till you are you are fed the same medicine you know people who don't get convinced with an argument should be made to walk the same street to realize what it feels you know the amazing thing is even after that some people don't learn the ability to learn is a rarity therefore management of change and organizational de development is one of those classical topics which will always be learnt which will be selectively implemented and which 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 will never be fully effective because that's determined by the context now of course the change model with uh, goes back to harvey and brown this has again four columns degree of change impact of culture the resistances and chances of success so remember the four columns because this will go on throughout this matrix degree of change if it is small then impact on culture is slight resistance is low chances of success are high if the change degree of change is small and the impact on culture is high resistance will be moderate chances of success will be moderate if the degree degree of change is large impact of culture is low the resistance is moderate then chances of success are moderate degree of change is large impact is high resistance is the highest chances of success are remote 
Therefore, it is my proposition to you that create stakeholders in change. Remember, the vaccine is always produced from the disease. And for diseases for which there is no vaccine, you work on that component of this, whatever is possible to take away on the slide and you convert that. For example, if you have a throat problem, then you collect the swab there and from the swab, you create the vaccine for it. Hafkins Institute was known for it. So, if there is a vested interest in resisting change, the art lies in creating a vested interest in marking the change. If, the some, if some people are worried that they would lose their empire, let the people who would gain an empire head the negotiation. So, you co-opt people, you widen your base and you negotiate. That is the way change is undertaken. Seven value based assumptions organizational members do not always share with OD specialists. Organization development specialists are never fully incorporated because they are change agents. And whereas everyone talks of change, you heard me say nobody wants a change. What are these seven elements? Doing better is doing better is a good thing. The facts are friendly. People should have ownership of their life space. A challenging environment requires the system to be adaptive in terms of its structure. Change does not have to be haphazard. The results of change actions are not always 100 percent predictable and controllable. Behavioral science knowledge can contribute to organizational health. Now, these are seven value assumptions if you practiced it as a part of the OD intervention, the OD intervention would work lot more smoothly. Organization people do not share this with OD specialists because they do not show to the OD specialists how doing better would be a good thing. Because no OD specialist has contextual information. Any OD intervention requires carrying the contextual information along with them, which is always locked with the people who work within the system. So, to crack it, it is my submission that create internal stakeholders in the system. And then they will be able to show you the way on how doing better it will be a good thing, how facts are supporting change, how people would have ownership of their life space if the change was introduced, how a challenging environment requires the system to be adaptive in terms of its structure and processes and that if the environment, if the environment change, that what are the ways in which you will have to change. And I was giving you the example of DVD. Can change agents Change agents are people with responsibility for implementing change in an organization. How can change agents be classified? Which is why you have so many jokes which are beamed at change agents or efficiency experts. There is, there is nothing more unpopular than an, an a, a, a efficiency expert because everyone talks of efficiency, nobody wants efficiency because efficiency requires everyone to pull himself up by the shoelace. Change agents can be internal, change agents can be external and I will tell you something which you will find the moment you become one or the other. 
a lot of internal change agents stymie the external change agents. Their argument is why get an external change agent? I am good enough. If you were good enough, then why didn't you cause the change till now? You know, it's it's like going to a gym. If you could lose weight in your on your own, you would have done it by now. But case after case, the moment you bring in an external change agent, the internal HR specialist gets up and says, "What does he know? I know the organization. What does he say, which I don't know already?" Okay, Ducky, you, 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 you know the organization, you know the techniques, why didn't you do it? Please remember human frailties can be a problem in managing change. Sheer jealousy, sheer inability to recognize that you need help. Remember as another takeaway, the ability to know that you need help and the ability to give help when somebody requires is a very rare human attribute. The amazing thing of life is people do not realize they need help. They will take shelter under seniority, age, rank, location, claims to contextual knowledge to prevent a simple acceptance that you need help. And by the same token, people do not like to provide help for many, many reasons. One, they do not know how to give help. <coughs> Sorry, they do not know when to give help. They do not know how to sell help. The word sell is being used to convince others. And worst of all, because they do not want to create competition. But change agents can be internal or external. Now, change agents advantages uh, and disadvantages. External change agents, what are the advantages? He has a credibility as an expert, no negative history with organizational members, objective outsider, wide experience. What are the disadvantages? Perceived as an outsider, lacks knowledge of the organization and its technology often has limited availability and time constraints. In other words, has is not always available to the organization and all will always have some time constraints. Internal change agents, what are the advantages? Credibility as an insider, knows the people, the culture, the norms of the organization, knows the technology, continuously available personal relationships. What are the disadvantages? Often not perceived as an expert, may have negative history with the organization, may lack objectivity, has limited experience with other organizations. So, what are the points for discussion? A satisfactory relationship between the change agent and the organizational member is critical to the success of any OD effort. Which is why in my limited experience as an OD intervention agent, I have always found it useful to ask for an internal coordinator and two, wherever possible I ask the CMD to be a party to the consultative process. After all, I am carrying his baby and I am not willing to serve as a dry nurse. And if he is so high and mighty that he has no time for a discussion or he has no time to discuss the intervention in operational terms, well then I do not want to work for that organization. In fact, whenever I have had to mix together consulting with training, I insist that the CEO be present in the training session itself so that operational decisions can be taken there and then. 
if you create a training session which leads to operational changes as the discussion goes on, the chances of the training intervention being successful are far larger than if you keep sitting there and discussing and then a paper is sent to the CEO who inevitably begins the discussion by saying, so what happened? So you already have the first refraction. A communicator is going to say what happened in the session. And the fidelity will always be less than 100%. Then you as a change agent have to sit there like a stakeholder arguing for what you want to change rather than saying this is a proposition now discuss it and tell me what you want to be done. You spend too much time explaining yourself. There are other techniques which I have used in my consulting processes but the details here may not be necessary other than to point out there is such a thing as consulting styles. And each consultant has a consulting style. And one of the essential in ingredients of an external agent of consulting style should be how to cope with change. A trusting relationship helps the consultant deal with the cha changes brought by those who are uncomfortable or in disagreement with the change effort, which is very important which is why the, your branding as a consultant works. And the consultancy's style and values are key factors in establishing trust and making relationships successful. How change agents build trusting relationship is yet another question. Because you see when you are saying that if you develop a trusting relationship, you will be heard better, you will be able to manage change better, then you are assuming a solution. A palpably silly mistake to make. Again, as an illustration, you may have heard the story of an architect, a physicist and an economist marooned on an island and amongst them they had a can of beans. So the problem was if they were to have something to eat the can must be opened. So they sat together to deliberate what to do and the physicist was off the mark first. He said very simple you chaps are silly. You light a fire beneath the can, the can will explode. To which the architect said you stupid if you light a fire beneath a can and the can explodes the beans are going to fall into the sand. What will you eat? So the physicist said oh yeah. So tell me your solution. He said you build a canopy on top of it. So the two were in a merry argument and the economist did not seem interested at all. So after they had worn themselves out with arguing with each other, nobody was going to be convinced with the other person's argument, they turned around to the economist and said, and what do you have to say? The, the economist said, both of you are stupid. Can opening is such, an, such a simple proposition. So both of them said, then tell me or tell us. And he said, you assume a can opener and open the can. Now if you can assume a can opener to open the can, then you are assuming a solution. A lot of OD specialists have this problem. When you say a trusting relationship is the answer, you are proposing a solution which is being assumed. If you have a trusting relationship, then of course there is no, re no resistance. An inherent question of management of change therefore becomes how change agents build trusting relationship. So if you would tell me how to get a can opener, I would indeed open the can. But you can't tell me you assume a can opener. So you, you can't say a trusting relationship, your consulting is on. You know, tell me how to create a trusting relationship and that's what, let's look at it. There are several types of 
discomforting responses and learn to deal with it. You notice the word, uh, the, uh, the two letters 3 and 6 here. This means both of them have their back to each other. There is no communication. When the relationship is like 36, you will have a disconfirming responses. You will have an impervious response. That's all right, but everything is that's all right, but they won't listen to you. It's an impervious response. An interrupting response. The moment you will start talking, the other person will say, No, 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 that's not the way it is. No. Look, I haven't finished it, doesn't matter, it doesn't work that way. But listen to me. Why should I listen to you? I know you are wrong. An irrelevant response. You want to propose a change and they say, you know, you, we will look at the whole discussion after we have had coffee. Then they have coffee. Then he wants to begin the discussion again and say, it's too late now today, we will discuss it tomorrow. Do you want to discuss it at all? An irrelevant response. A tangible response. He will say, you see, actually to sell, to promote the sales, we need important pro promotional interventions of the type of <coughs> linkages it would establish with the kind of uh, market segment we deal with. If you are selling dhoti, you do not put up a hoarding near an international airport. So, the tangible response would be, no, 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 we have tried uh, selling dhoti, nothing works. We tried selling dhoti even in, by putting up a hoarding near the domestic airport, it does not work. Now, you have confused the issue. You have created a tangible response to a stupid suggestion, it is totally derailed. When people do not like your suggestions, all you have said is, have proper promotional techniques which is tuned in to the market segment where your product will sell. He will give a tangible response, we tried it during at the international airport. So, you say no, it does not work there. No, no, we tried it even at the domestic airport. He will give you a tangible response, but the tangible response is at a tangent. It, it, it does not help you understand the issue at all. An impersonal response. You see what happens is, all people in this organization have tried change so many times that they are tired of it. Now, then what am I doing here? No, the whole problem you should be going home. Clearly you are not wanted. So, you can you can have disconfirming responses, learn to deal with it. An ambiguous response, let us look at it, you know, we should try it out. Let us have a pilot project. Now, the pilot project is the quickest way of derailing an intervention, <coughs> sounds very good. I mean after all, it is one of those innocent uh, suggestions like appointing a subcommittee. First, you appoint a committee to get a report, then you get a report, then to look at the operational factors, you appoint a subcommittee to look at it. Then after the subcommittee has expanded it, you want somebody to uh, look at its financial feasibility, you have killed it, by which time you, yes, you have made it walk through three committees, the whole thing is dead, it is outdated. An incongruous response, there is nothing coherent about your response, you are merely irritating the person. Supportive and dis defensive behavior. Supportive behavior would have a d proper description, problem orientation, spontaneity, <coughs> empathy, quality, provisionalism. But a defensive behavior will have evaluations, control, it will have a strategy, it will have neutrality, it would, it would have superiority, superiority and it would have certainty. The proposition which I am trying to put across to you is inculcate in your client group if you want to manage change supportive behavior. Get them to move towards problem orientation. Remember what we started talking about.
how can change agents be classified and then we went into looking at how can a change agent build a trusting relationship. Let us not forget the question which we are trying to answer. And to create that trusting relationship, it is important to create supportive behavior. If you create a supportive behavior, your organization development intervention will have more chances of success. The consultant must of course be a role model. He listens, does not sell. He does not push too hard for his opinion. He lets the opinion come out of the collective discussion which he should try to sum up. Fits into the organization and embraces its mission and culture. He does not want to create a new organization. This is how you manage change. This is how you create a trusting relationship. You do not begin by telling people you are wrong. You begin by listening to people and you begin by letting them identify their problem. He provides good, good customer service. He protects confidentiality. There is a classical novel and I believe it has been even converted into a movie. I would recommend it warmly as a sterling example of what professionalism is say in the legal profession. The name of the movie is The Firm. Take a look. And under very difficult circumstances, the lead character is able to establish how you can be professionally ethical and how you can protect client confidentiality yet nail the evil. It is only when you have a problem of interpretation of the law that you start maneuvering around the law in the name of getting justice. It is an outstanding movie. It make, makes a point very powerfully and you admire it even though your agreement or disagreement may be a, a separate matter altogether. In other words, a consultant must protect confidentiality. Nobody would talk to him otherwise. He challenges assumptions because unless you challenge the assumptions, you cannot question the derivations. A further takeaway from this session, when two people disagree over something, it does not always help to find out what they are disagreeing with. It will be possible to create an agreement if you check out what their assumptions were. So, in case of disagreements, check out the assumptions in which the disagreements are rooted. If each party believes the other party is evil, you can never come to a resolution, irrespective of what they are quarreling over. You must have, you must create a commonality of assumptions is a recognized expert. This is very important. A consultant must have referent power. To manage change, you must carry conviction to lead the process of change. That is how you create a trusting relationship. You are going down a road, you want to find out the path to a destination, you ask at random, then you assess, does he know or does not he know? And if you have any doubts, you go back and ask that same question again. And you go on asking that question till you meet a person or you see a map and then you say, ah, that is the route and then you stop asking. That is trust. If you are a change agent, you must be able to evoke trust in your respondents. Provides perspective and objectivity. Celebrates with the internal staff. In other words, it needs very high degree of empathy. Change agents role within an organization is several leaders as change agents, managers as change agents, human resources professionals as change agents. The interesting thing is a leader, a manager, a human resources professional are all change agents of a different perspective. Their assumptions are different. 
a leader will like to demand compliance an organizer will like a manager will like to organize change a human resources professional will always try to understand the frameworks of reference of change and which hat you wear in your role as a change agent for managing change or or organization development in organizations will be a factor of which one of these prescriptions will work with what community of employees what community of managers with what community of professionals and i am using the word community in the sense of group of people so finally how can change be managed to manage change you will have to think of whether you want mental change phys- uh, vital change physical change if a system is moving at mental level then an organization is going to face a different set of issues and challenges depending upon whether it is a phys- at the physical vital or mental level in other words mental change will be needed in knowledge organizations vital change will be needed in organizations which are partly knowledge based partly manufacturing based and physical change will be needed in manufacturing organizations i then bring you to a final chart which sums up what we have been discussing till now how then do we manage change when given where an organization may be at and there is a sequence introspective techniques appreciative inquiry managing from the future rewarding inventive accountability infusing intricate solu- situational understanding insisting on uncompromising straight talk now depending upon where you come from you can go from this point to this point or you can go on the reverse you can begin with introspective techniques if your group is intelligent enough for it and if your group is a tough set of people who believe they know it all you might as well sit down and say hey listen you lad let's get to some straight talk but in either cases the willingness to talk must be there here again you have got physical and mental level of operation you move from physical to the mental and this sequence on the x, on the x axis is adversarial to positive an adversarial situation will call for insisting on uncompromising straight talk and as it moves forward when it becomes positive then you have introspective techniques hey listen it didn't occur to me that i had had missed a point myself so it is a question of again the assumptions of the relationship to sum up therefore managing change in organization development or organization development in organization calls for creating trust calls for an understanding of what level of operations require what level of intervention and there are a whole host of intervention techniques which is a separate matter of intervention but remember be it as a leader be it as a manager be it as a human resources development specialist if you want to keep your organization alive you may have no options but also wear the hat of a change agent because that's what an organization needs to keep pace with the changing environment thank you